you know what he does at 2 o'clock? He gets together with Lewis Howell at 2 o'clock after renting a fast horse around noon. He and Lewis Howell get together and visit at about 2 o'clock. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but I bet Tal does. As Powell and Booth talk, Booth's planned assassination of President Lincoln will now turn into a plot that will not only include President Lincoln. You know that? He's going to target three other people that evening. So he and Powell get together and decide, you know, Lincoln's not enough. Let's, let's really make chaos in this union government. And they target three additional people to assassinate. How many people knew that? <laughs> Who are the three people they targeted? Secretary of State William Seward, who was laying in his bed at his home. Recovering from a carriage accident. They targeted him. Who else might they target? If they're going to make chaos in the government. Andrew. How about Vice President Andrew Johnson? And who's the most popular non-politician in history at this point? Grant. Ulysses S. Grant. So, Powell and Booth get together at 2 o'clock and this plan of assassinating the president turns into assassinating four powerful figures in the United States government. Now this is really interesting because Booth was an eccentric thinker and his plan was that they would assassinate each of these people at the exact same time in four, well, three different locations. Okay? Now this is really something. And he's got this all planned out that it we're going to do it at the same time, because if you do one before the other, what's going to happen? Word gets out and precautions are going to be made. So he carefully planned, we're going to hit these four people at the same time, different locations. Where was he going to hit President Lincoln? Ford's Theater. Where was he going to hit Secretary of State Seward? At his home. Where is he going to hit Vice President Johnson? Good guess, but... Vice Presidents have their own residence at his residence, which we'll talk about later. And where is he going to get Grant? Well, Ford's Theater, because he thinks he's going to, he doesn't know that he has turned Lincoln down. He's gotten word that Grant was invited, but he won't have a shot at Grant. That, but he thinks he's good, okay? So he's thinking about him at Ford's Theater also. So, that evening, the person that would be, will be responsible to guard President Lincoln's box at the theater was John Parker, who is a Washington, D.C. police officer. You have to remember that there was not secret service at this time, and the security was a lot different. And so they simply had a police officer guard the box in which Lincoln would be sitting in that evening. And the person responsible to guard that box was D.C. police officer John Parker. So let's move to the evening, 8.30 p.m. The presidential party arrives at Ford's Theater. And how do they arrive, do you remember? What time did the play start? before 8.30, okay? So the presidential party arrives late, which I find a little rude, but whatever. So what is the, the play is going, and what do they do as soon as the president shows up? They stop the play, and the band in the orchestra at the play plays patriotic music as the presidential party is seated. And who's the presidential party? Rathbone, Clara Harris, the president, as well. So they come in late, the play stops in their honor, I guess, the band, which, and you got to remember they didn't have music like we do today, they don't turn on the CD player or your phone, so they have an orchestra that plays a dramatic music during the play, so the orchestra starts playing patriotic music until the presidential party gets set in the presidential booth. 
and the audience of about 1,700 people give the presidential party a standing ovation as they come in and the patriotic music's going to play. 1,700. 1,700. Now, you've been in there. That's a lot of people in there. I mean, I bet there wasn't 1,700 when you were in there, but that would be like a packed house, you know what I'm saying? Now, once the presidential party got seated, the play production continued. These continued where they left off. Well, at 9.30 p.m., John Wilkes Booth arrives at the theater with a single-shot Derringer pistol and a hunting knife. Did you see the knife? Too? Yeah. Arrived at the theater with a single-shot Derringer pistol and a hunting knife at 9.30. Now, when he got there, he asked Edmund Spangler, who was he again? He was a drunken, drunken stagehand, to hold his horse. Okay, to hold his horse. Once he handed his horse to Spangler, Booth left and went to a nearby saloon for a drink. Ordering whiskey instead of his usual brandy. So he asks, he goes, he arrives at 9.30, he gives his horse to Edmund Spangler, tells him to hold the horse. He heads to a local tavern where he drinks whiskey instead of brandy. Why? I'm sure you guys agree. Right. Well, yeah, but, but he's using a brandy drink. What's the difference? Well, he, I hope you, maybe you probably don't. Mm -hmm. Whiskey makes people mean. Well, or what else does whiskey do to a person? If you talk about the Old West, under stressful situations, people didn't drink brandy, they drank whiskey. Okay? Oh, so whiskey's more powerful than brandy. So historians believe that he ordered the whiskey to calm his nerves. Because he knew what he's going to do. What's that? Booth did, yes. Spangler's holding the horse for now. What's going to change? But anyway. So Booth comes, heads, Edmund Spangler, his horse, heads to a tavern, and they note in history that he ordered a whiskey instead of a brandy, probably to calm his nerves, because he knew what he was going to do. That's long. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Spangler, getting back to Spangler, he can't hold this horse because he's on duty that night. So he hands Booth's horse to a young peanut vendor, that would be a young little, little guy who sold peanuts outside the play to people, by the name of Joseph Burroughs, and asked Joseph Burroughs to hold the horse for him. So, Booth gives the horse to Spangler, he takes off to the tavern, shortly after that, Spangler hands the reins of the horse to Joseph Burroughs, young, very young, teenage kid in his 11, 12 year oldish area to hold this horse because he's got to work. Well, Booth leaves the saloon after having his drink and arrives back at Ford's Theater at approximately 10.07 p.m. 10.07, he returns back to the theater. Now, this is kind of weird, but just bear with me. So he comes in the back door and then the, the, the stage where they're playing is kind of, kind of elevated. There's a, like a basement under it. So he walks in the back door, opens up a trap door, goes down a ladder, under, walks right under the stage, and then comes out on the other side back on main level. Does that make sense? So when he walked in on ground level, he opened up a trap door that was under the stage, and he traveled all the way the length of the stage, under the stage, so he wouldn't be seen and then came out on the other side, closer to Lincoln's box. Well, John Parker, who didn't see any issue that was supposed to be guarding the presidential box, abandons his post and decides to find a seat more comfortable to watch the rest of the play performance. I mean, this thing started before 8.30. It's almost, you know, it's 10 after 10. Well, everything looks good here. So he left his post and went and found a better seat to watch the rest of the play, which was nearing its end, right? So the presidential box is left unprotected. 
Well, after Booth came out of that trap door back on ground level, so to speak, he walked up a staircase, and I'm sorry you didn't get to see that, did you? Or did you? He walked up the staircase towards the presidential booth. So, not an artist of any kind, but I think it'll make sense to you here. So, there's a staircase that goes up to the presidential booth, and the play is being played here, and there's also a booth over here. So, booth goes up the staircase. Well, there is a door or kind of a wall in between. So he goes in here and then there's another door here and there's a space. It's not, it's probably from me to the wall. From the first door to the entrance to the presidential booth, you know, where the president would be standing. Over standing. Now, what he did is he went through that first door and he barricaded the entry with a wood bar. So he walked in here and barricaded this so nobody could get in this first door. And then he had a s small area to walk, maybe from here to the wall, where the president, there would be another door where the president would be sitting just inside that door in the presidential booth. So he, again, walks through the first door, the entry door of that small room, and shuts it with the wood bar. How's well, he gonna what's that? How's he gonna We're going to tell you. <laughs> Yeah, at approximately 10.15 p.m., our American cousin reached Act 3, Scene 2 in the play. At 10.15 p.m., the play, Our American Cousin, had reached Act 3, Scene 2. And it was at this point in the performance that actor Harry Hawk would perform the funniest, most humorous line in the play that evening. So at this point in the performance, actor Harry Hawk would perform the funniest line in the play that evening. And this was all planned by Booth. Why would he plan the assassination of a president during this particular time. Because everybody would burst into laughter and any noise he would make would be muffled. So John Wilkes Booth had perfectly timed his assassination of President Lincoln during this particular part of the play performance. And because he knew the actor's line would result in loud laughter from the approximate 1,700 people in attendance. And it would give him his opportunity to open the door of the presidential box where the president was sitting watching the play performance. Not, not any question, I planned to the T. Well, as actor Harry Hawk performed his humorous line in the play, laughter occurred as he had planned. Booth opened the door of the presidential box, put his 44 caliber Derringer one-shot pistol at the back of Lincoln's head, six inches away, and fired. So again, as actor Harry Hawk performed his humorous line in the play, Booth opens the door to the presidential box, points his 44 caliber single shot derringer in the back of President Lincoln's head, and fired. Yes, Cody? Is the line the something December entire We ain't got there yet. Okay. A 44 caliber ball is a big caliber, and it six inches away, the bullet ends up entering the back of President Lincoln's head and lodges behind his right eye. Didn't get all the way through, it lodged behind his right eye. So it comes in from an angle back here and comes out, doesn't come out, but lodges behind his right eye. So the bullet enters Lincoln in the back of the head and lodges behind his right eye. He immediately slumps over and loses consciousness. Immediately. So what happens next? Major Rathbone grabs Booth after the shot as Booth drops his Derringer on the floor of the presidential box. So Rathbone reacts to this and grabs at Booth. And the derringer that was used to kill the president, which Callan has seen, which is pretty cool, but they still have it, falls to the floor of the presidential box. 
As Rathbone is grabbing towards Booth after the shot, Booth takes that knife out and slashes Major Rathbone's left arm between the shoulder and his elbow. He slashes his arm with that hunting knife. So again, as Major Rathbone is grabbing at Booth after the shot, Booth takes out his hunting knife and slashes Major Rathbone's left arm between the shoulder and the elbow, which you've seen that knife also. It amazes me that they have this stuff too. I mean, really. And that you can see it. You know, the gun used to kill John F. Kennedy's in the National Archives. Nobody gets to see it. But this one is on display in the Museum of Fort Cedar, which you will see in about a year and four weeks. Well, historians aren't sure on this, but as Wilkes began to jump down towards the stage from the presidential box, Major Rathbone did grab at his coat to try to prevent him from escape, and there are mixed reviews that Booth caught his spur on the American flag that was drooped over the presidential box with the picture of George Washington and made him fall awkwardly to the stage. So as John Wilkes Booth began to jump down towards the stage from the presidential box, and how far do you think that is, Talon? Eight, ten feet, maybe? from the box to the stage. Rathbone grabbed at Booth's coat to try to prevent him from escape, and as Rathbone attempted to grab Booth, Booth caught his spur on the American flag that was drooped, or excuse me, draped over the presidential box. He fells awkwardly, they, they say in history, 12 feet, 12 feet to the stage, and breaks a bone in his ankle. So Rathbone, after being slashed by Booth, grabs at him. Booth catches his spur on the American flag that's draped over the presidential box. And he falls awkwardly, the approximate 12 feet to the stage, breaking a bone in his ankle. The actor that he is, Cody, from the stage, Booth turns and faces the crowd of 1,700 people and shouts, Sick, Scepter, Sick Scepter Scepter Sick Scepter Tyrannus. Sick Scepter ty Tyrannus, which is a Latin phrase meaning thus always to tyrants. S I C. Sick Semper Tyrannus, which was a Latin phrase meaning thus always to tyrants, referring to Lincoln as what? A tyrant. So from the stage, in the role of an actor, Booth turned and faced the crowd of 1,700 people and shouted, Six Semper Tyrannus, which was a Latin phrase meaning, Thus always to tyrants. Dragging his broken leg, he makes his escape through the back door of the stage, painfully mounts his horse, and rides off into the night. So again, dragging his broken leg, Booth makes his escape through the back door of the stage, painfully mounts his horse, and rides off into the night. We will begin on Monday the events in Ford's Theater concerning Lincoln, and then we will move to Booth's flight. But I want to make a historic point, and Talon's been there, Ford's Theater has been refurbished. You know, after that assassination, by the way, I don't know if you read the history on this, they were so embarrassed the thing just kind of went to pot. And it wasn't until the Dwight Eisenhower administration in the late 50s that they made a huge effort to re-renovate this theater and get it back into working condition because it was just an embarrassment. Kind of like Dallas, Texas is an embarrassment from the Kennedy assassination. So Eisenhower put together a, re a renovation of that. But in the old days, they had that American flag on the box, and the reason why they had the picture of George Washington, that was kind of the presidential seal before they invented the presidential seal. If you ever watch presidents in recent history, anywhere they speak, this is always in front of them. But they didn't have one of those. The presidential seal was the portrait of the first president. Okay? All right, well, Monday, I'm not sure again what we're going to do tomorrow. I will let... Brianna, knowing you check remind tonight so you know what you're supposed to bring and what you're supposed to do. 
um, and we'll kind of go from there. And then we get back Monday, we'll tell you about the events in Ford's Theater immediately after the assassination and the flight of John Wilkes. What did they do to Parker? And that's a good question. Nothing. 